I showed you my pintle injector. Please respond. Oh my gosh, my phone is ringing. Can't you hear it? What does it say? Hello? You were wrong, Mr. Astronaut. Lunar Starship won the contract. Yeah, I, I heard. No, I'm not gonna talk about it until December. Morning, everyone. I can't read calendars. Today, we're gonna to talk about the HLS decision, why Starship won, and what this means for Artemis. I figured I'd do this because the decision and the GAO report are now still fresh in our minds. Uh, and, okay, I didn't realize Blue Origin would sue NASA over this, so. So before we begin, I wanna make a few notes. The first one is that this is an off the cuff video. I didn't plan on doing this, this isn't in the schedule. I have been reading about pressure-fed launch vehicles and space guns for the last month, so that's been on my mind instead of lunar landers. So the second point is that criticizing Starship Part 3 will still happen in December. I'm only going to talk about lunar Starship based on the GAO report and the source selection statement. Anything else will be saved for Part 3 in December. And if there's something about Starship as a launch system that does bleed into this, I'll just note that with a big three that appears. The third is that we will be ignoring Blue Origin's uh, catty behavior. Everyone in the launch industry does lawsuits over contracts. Blue Origin just has some of the worst optics imaginable. Four, I'm only going off what the source selection statement and the GAO report say. Nothing else. I don't care what Elon says or tweets. Five, for a full disclosure, the company I work for is named in the GAO report. It's not part of the Lunar Lander contract, but it is in this document. And sixth, the most important thing to remember here is the golden rule of contracting. Give the customer what they want. If NASA wants pictures of Spider-Man, you give them pictures of Spider-Man. If you have Iron Man in the pictures, that's great, but what they want is pictures of Spider-Man. Okay, and kind of an addendum is when I did my senior design project, it was kind of like this. So I have some experience with this. So let's take a look at the landers. We'll be starting with Dynetics, then with National Team, then Starship, because you know, Starship's the one that won. I have to comment on that. Very few good things were said about Alpaca. The main one is that it is a single element lander, so it doesn't need on-orbit assembly. The other is that it is low to the ground, which means it's easy for crew and equipment to get in and out of the spacecraft. This is especially good if a crew member injures themselves, so they can you know, get in and out. Internally, there are two crew stations and rather large windows, which are rather useful. The long-term plans of the lander involve constructing a depot, which would enhance the, the spacecraft's capability to lunar destinations, as well as the commercial aspects of the system. And, and that's about it. That's all that's good. Another issue is the propellant resupply system, which, based on the source selection statement, Dynetics completely bungled. Specifically, the operational specifics of the system, the maturity of the Centaur tanker design, how they're going to manage the LOX methane propellant, and how they're going to get the design built and tested in time. That's bad. It's a key component of the system, and it was described as inconsistent and insufficient. Their development schedule was considered unrealistic as well, which kind of makes sense. Uh, a big issue apparently was the fact that their test missions weren't going to give them any meaningful data and lessons. So that's not good. So overall, not good. Okay, so I'm just going to read what I wrote because I'm just having one of those days where I can't remember anything. Okay, so National Team Lander. So for this, I think NASA was aiming for this to be their their selection. It kind of matches the concept art. and They gave it the most money. I think this is what they wanted. So they had two strengths for this in the source selection statement. The first is that they had put a lot of effort into abort capabilities and contingencies for the lander, including surface operations. So they put a lot of effort into crew safety and making sure everyone didn't die. That's a good thing. The second is that they used dissimilar elements in the system, right? It's three parts built by three different companies with their own internal designs. So 
having that had, had safety, uh, right? So for example, the ascent stage used pressure-fed hypergols. That's a good thing, kind of like the old LEM, right? Uh, let's see, this meant it could also be on multiple launch vehicles, which I, I actually is gonna work against it, but we'll get to that. Uh, so it adds, adds flexibility to the system, right? Three launches, that's good. Uh, this selection also mentions the ability to handle more EVAs than they want and can carry uh, 850 kilograms extra cargo to the surface. So that's good. Uh, and now we get to the bad. So propulsion is their first big issue. Uh, none of the engines were at a TRL that would be considered acceptable and Blue Origin did not address this in their schedule, right? So the, so the engines they're proposing aren't ready and Blue Origin did not say, hey, here's our plan to make them ready in time to what NASA would want. So that's the problem, All right? So, oh, a clarification. So when I did this in my senior design project, it used ion engines to get from low earth orbit to the moon. And instead of using xenon, we selected argon. So for that, what we did was we said, okay, this is why we're using argon. And I designed a test mission to prove that argon would work as a propellant in our resupply system and just for fuel. So another thing, I'm, I, this, is, this is me speculating now, is that using BE-7, a pump-fed engine, on the descent element was also one of the big points of risk. Again, these are pressure feds. They're very simple. They have three moving parts, effectively. Right? Pump feds add risk and complexity to the system that NASA might consider unacceptable. So, oh, the engine development schedule, of course, was bad. Uh, specifically, the ascent engines would be going through uh, preliminary design review after critical design review of the lander. That's just a no-no. The parts of the lander should go through their CDRs before the whole system. It's, it's like designing a cell phone without a battery. Uh, propellant management isn't good either, as noted. Blue was planning on using liquid hydrogen for the lander, which would require a lot of design and testing to make work. Uh, hydrogen is just a jerk, and they didn't adequately address this. Again, hydrogen is a jerk. So another big issue that NASA noted would be that they would be testing critical components on the first crewed landing. No. Again, read up on Apollo's development. Uh, they talked about not having five-sixths of the communication system working and an inability to land where NASA wants to go. That's not good. I think it was only specifically designed for polar landing sites, nowhere else, which is, don't do that. Go anywhere. Uh, and bad mission timelines for the crew. Something to do with like after landing and then before takeoff, the crew would have to do an exhausting EVA. Uh, you can read about their financial stuff. I'm not gonna go into that. That's not my purview. Oh, and before you scream at me about the latter, it's not mentioned in the source selection statement nor the GAO report, okay? It's not in there. The good for this can be described as it's big. Elon's gonna fund half of it, and SpaceX has an aggressive testing schedule, and they substantiated it in their report very well. So in the source selection statement, what's listed as bad is that the system is complex and high risk. If you read the GAO report, it requires up to 16 launches to, to work. So one lunar starship, one deleted, it's a depot, and 14 tanker flights. 16 launches 12 days apart is complex and high risk with reuse and propellant transfer management on orbit. What they're proposing is a really, really big system. So another would be development times and schedule keeping. Uh, SpaceX has to get Starship architecture to work by 2024, plus the development of their pressure fed LOX methane engines that, they were, that they, you saw, and their lunar specific hardware. This was originally noted in the first source selection statement, which noted SpaceX as terrible at hitting schedules and deadlines. Again, you can read about this. Uh, oh, and the crew compartment is 30 meters off the surface. If you thought nine meters was bad, Starship won because NASA has the budget for one lander and SpaceX provided the best technical presentation of their system. Now, you're not here for me to scream about how all rockets are now obsolete because Lunar Starship was selected. So here's the thing. Lunar Starship is bad. So the first thing here is I do think SpaceX has learned how to effectively underbid. Now, if you notice, if you read the JO reports, the SpaceX bid without Elon's money would cost roughly the same as the Blue Origin proposal. So it's not low cost. The other thing here is I am okay with Elon funding half of Starship development. 
Starship is his boondoggle. I don't want taxpayer dollars going into that as much as we need it. Only for the lunar lander. So the other thing here I want to emphasize is cost isn't necessarily everything. I think technical competence should beat cost anywhere. But so the thing is, I don't think Starship is going to be cheap either, even with full reusability. But that's uh, secondly, uh, 16 launches should have been the biggest red flag of them all. This is an inherently high risk system, and I'm surprised that this was kind of hand waved, I'd say. Uh, so I'm going to assume that SpaceX is really good at, you know, technical writing and substantiation for this. So if you want to be an engineer, uh, take note. So I would put this as a serious risk for the system. That many launches means that many uh, possible failures and it could derail the whole thing. It, is, it depends on, you know, how long does deleted have before boil off becomes a problem? Uh, what about the tankers? What about, again, launch cadence and just operational capabilities? I know Elon said he's aiming for eight launches. Uh, that depends on how well this system actually works. Uh, boil off mitigation, tanker capacity, orbital operations, that sort of thing. Uh, now, again, personally, I don't think Starship will hit its weight targets or hit the cadence they want, but that's more for three. So my honest opinion is that the high launch cadence for this architecture, or any architecture like this, should have been the, should have ended it. Should have said, nope. Uh, also, Lunar Starship is simply too big to be a workable system for Artemis. NASA wanted a Gulf Stream, and SpaceX gave them a 747. Now, 747s can work as really big business jets, but there are places that 747s can't go or aren't optimized for that a Gulfstream would be better. Starship is a poorly optimized system for this, and it should not have been selected. And in fact, none of these should have been selected. That's right, you heard me, none of these should have been picked. HLS is fundamentally flawed, and you can find this in the source selection statement with one word. Commercial. There are no commercial lunar needs bigger than a refrigerator, and there won't be any human commercial activity on the moon for a few decades. The fundamental flaw with HLS is this. To do a human lunar landing, you either need a super heavy lift launch vehicle, or you need to assemble something in low Earth orbit. Uh, for reference, Apollo and the Japanese lunar lander proposals. Starship is bizarrely both of these. It's a super heavy lift vehicle that needs refueling to go anywhere beyond LEO. There are no serious commercial lunar launchers. And you can see this in the national team design, which was optimized for a 5.4 meter diameter fairing. Well, that means you end up with a vehicle that's tall and thin, like you ended up with. The only way to make a short and fat system, which would be more applicable, is to launch a lot or make an incredibly complicated system, which just isn't a good solution. This is why SLS having a launch cadence of one flight per year is a problem, because the Block 1B has a payload fairing 8.4 meters in diameter, and the Block 2 will have one that's up to 10 meters in diameter. This allows you A, the mass to the moon that's capable of building a same lunar lander, and you can have one that's short and fat. In the description, I have a compendium of lunar lander designs for you to look at and browse just to see what kind of a nightmare this is. So look at that if you want to. I also think this problem comes from commercial crew, which I would not consider to be a resounding success. Starliner is, well, Starliner, and Crew Dragon had its problems early in development. SpaceX, you know, blew one up, their parachutes didn't work for the longest time, and both these capsules were horribly behind schedule, or still are. So at the time, commercial crew did make sense. The wind down of Constellation, NASA realized that using Orion for LEO and deep space missions was just not cost effective. So they looked at the few private companies that were independently developing their own crew capsules and decided to fund those to see if it would be a better and more cost effective option. So, you know, Kistler K1, the T-Space CXV, Crew Dragon, that sort of thing. Uh, it made sense for NASA to take the risk on these and make Orion exclusively a deep space vehicle. That worked. HLS is not that. So what does this mean for Artemis? Now, first, to assuage the fears of my more cynical viewers, Administrator Bill Nelson is trying to get Congress to fund another lander. And we see this in Appendix N, I think. 
Don't quote me on it. It's something like that. I think they're trying to get funding for another one. Also, 2024 as a landing is pretty much not going to happen. This has been established because of HLS and because of the spacesuits. So 2026 or 2028 are more realistic landing dates. If I understand this correctly, Lunar Starship is only contracted for two landings, a demonstration mission and then Artemis 3 before the second round comes through. Don't quote me on it, but I think that's what's happening. Charitably, I do think Lunar Starship will work on a technical level, but with hefty teething issues and going way over budget. But that goes under... Again, I think Lunar Starship is a completely non-optimized design. So the middling response to this is that you could theoretically make a more optimal system out of Starship. You know, take the cargo section up top, turn that into a two-stage lander, locks methane still, then use the rest of Starship as a tanker, depot, that sort of thing. This could theoretically lower the mass of, of the whole system and probably need less launches overall, which means a less risk system that's less complicated. For reference, there was a design study to take the space shuttle external tank, liquid oxygen tank, and turn that into a lunar habitat. So this isn't completely out of left field. So I'm, I'm back to this. Or the cynical doomer interpretation is that we just gave a few billion dollars to a system that's doomed to fail, run by a deranged con man narcissist with a god complex, killing Artemis and probably hindering future human space exploration programs. So as for Artemis as a whole, if Artemis is going to fail, it will be because of HLS. SLS and Orion are being stacked now. The system will be operational by the middle of next year, assuming nothing goes wrong. There are small demonstration missions as part of CLIPS that are being built now and will launch in the next few years. Gateway is done. Contracts are signed. International partners are starting to build parts of it. It has a launch date. All that is left for Artemis is HLS and anything to do on the moon. You know what the worst part about all this is? I wanted to see Starship succeed or fail based on its own merits. Now it has to work because I want to see people on the moon again. And of course, uh, Lunar Starship will be the baseline for the 2070 series lander once Musk establishes the Mars Free State. Wait, couldn't we just put a bunch of guys in a capsule and shoot them to the moon in a big space gun?